Good afternoon, everyone, and a welcome to the Moreau Lecture at King's College in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. I greet you in the name of the Congregation of Holy Cross, which sponsors King's and hosts this annual lecture in honor of our founder, Blessed Basil Moreau. My name is Father Daniel Issing. I'm a Holy Cross priest and associate professor of theology at King's. This is the 41st Moreau Lecture and the first to take place virtually. So there's a great moment for us. Our speaker is Dr. M. Kathleen Caveney, the Daryl and Juliet Prof Libby Professor at Boston College. Kathy, I'd like to say it's a privilege to welcome you to Kings, but wisdom keeps you someplace else um, today. So, uh, but welcome. Uh, it's it's surely an honor to have you address us this afternoon as part of the oldest and most prestigious lecture series at King's. The topic of your lecture, focused as it is on citizenship, voting, and faith, could not be timelier. Less than a month from the election and absentee ballots being distributed here in Luzerne County this very week. In Holy Cross, it's our joyful mission to stand with the poor and the afflicted. We do this in imitation of Jesus to appeal as Jesus did for the conversion and deliverance of all people, for the conversion to a society that assures justice and liberty. It's not that we take sides against sinful enemies, our Constitution say. Before the Lord, all of us are sinners and none is enemy. Each and every human being is God's cherished child. And this truth sends us as a brotherhood across borders of every sort to care for victims of every injury, whether it be prejudice, famine, warfare, ignorance, infidelity, abuse, or natural calamity. Today's lecture celebrates this social mission, and our lecturer is one who is herself skilled at crossing academic borders of every sort, uh, in pursuit of virtue and justice. We're very blessed to have Dr. Caveney with us today. Today's event will proceed as follows. After my introduction, Dr. Caveney will speak for about 30 minutes. After she finishes, Dr. Pruce, Dr. Bernard Prusak and Mr. Christo Huntington will offer thoughtful responses. Christo, who is a senior here at King's, will pose the first questions to Dr. Caveney. Following this, uh, Dr. Caveney will take responses or questions from any of you who are participating in Zoom, uh, this Zoom lecture today. Dr. Margarita Rose uh, of the Economics Department will facilitate this question and answer. And I'll remind you of this again, but if you do have a question to ask, you will want to submit it via the Zoom chat to Margarita Rose. You can see her picture, lovely picture, and her name there on your screen. Let me take a moment to introduce the folks you are going to meet this afternoon in reverse of their order of appearance. So I'll begin with Dr. Rose. Uh, Margarita is a professor of economics at King's. She offers courses in environmental, developmental, and international economics. Margarita has been involved among many things, this is one of her involvements, with the Catholic Social Teaching Learning and Research Initiative for the past four years. Christo Huntington is a member of the class of 2021 with a major in political science and a minor in philosophy. He serves as president of the college's pre-law society, is a member of the student conduct panel, and was recently voted, you all should know this, to the Monarch Court for homecoming festivities that are um, happening this very week, in fact. So congratulations, Christo. After graduating next May, Christo hopes to attend uh, law school. Dr. Prusak is professor of philosophy and director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's. His scholarship, which includes two books, focuses in moral and social philosophy. He has widely published in scholarly journals and books on such topics as parental obligations and children's rights, conscience, just war, religious liberty, the moral limits of markets, and the principles of cooperation and double effect, so important in moral theology. 
And of course, now our main speaker, may I say a few things about this year's Moreau lecturer, Dr. Kathleen Caveney. Dr. Caveney holds a law degree from Yale Law School, as well as a PhD in ethics from Yale Graduate School. Her scholarship focuses on the relationship of law, religion, and morality. She enjoys a dual appointment at Boston College in the Department of Theology and the Law School. A member of the Massachusetts Bar, she clerked for the Honorable John T. Noonan Jr. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth District. I did get to know or have gotten to know in my years living in Berkeley, I had a chance to spend time with Dr. Noonan, or Honorable Judge Noonan. And uh, Professor Caveney also has worked as an associate at the Boston law firm of Ropes and Gray in its health law group. She was the 2018-2019 Carrie and Ann McGuire Chair in Ethics and American History at the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress. Professor Caveney has published four books and over a hundred articles and essays in journals and books specializing in law, ethics, and medical ethics. She serves on the masthead of Commonweal as a regular columnist. Her books include Law's Virtues, Fostering Autonomy and Solidarity in American Society, published in 2012, A Culture of Engagement, Law, Religion, and Morality in 2016, Prophecy Without Contempt, Religious Discourse in the Public Square in 2016, and Ethics at the Edges of Law, Christian Moralists and American Legal Thought in 2018. Professor Caveney regularly teaches contract law to first-year law students. She also teaches a number of seminars uh, which explore the relationship between theology, philosophy, and law, such as faith, morality, and law, mercy, and justice, complicity. Professor Caveney is the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Journal of Religious Ethics. She has been president of the Society of Christian Ethics. Professor Caveney has served on a number of editorial boards, including the American Journal of Jurisprudence, the Journal of Religious Ethics, the Journal of Law and Religion, and the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. She's been a pro visiting professor at Princeton University, Yale University, and Georgetown University. Maybe she'll come to King's College in Wilkes-Barre one day. We can only hope. Um, Actually, I met uh, Dr. Caveney first at the University of Notre Dame, where she taught law and theology uh, for many years as the John P. Murphy Foundation Professor of Law. We're very privileged to have her with us today. Just a couple of quick notes before I turn things over to Dr. Caveney. Just a reminder for those of you who are just coming on that this event is being recorded, and this recording will be posted in a couple of days on the McGowan Center Facebook page. Uh, the McGowan Center is kind of like our host uh, today. Dr. Prusak has been um, helping us very significantly uh, in this process. If you happen to be able to unmute yourself, which you shouldn't be able to do, please don't unmute yourself so we can listen to the speakers. Um, if you happen to be able to turn on your video, same thing, please, um, so we're not distracted. And again, I just remind you, uh, for the purposes of our Q&A, our question and answers, please send those through the chat function uh, to Dr. Uh, Margarita Rose. Friends, that's all you need to hear from me. I'll speak to you one more time at the end of today. But for now, I invite you to listen to Dr. Kathleen Caveney as she addresses us on Catholics as citizens, Catholics as voters. Thank you, Kathy. It's all yours. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good? Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be present with you uh, today virtually. I, I really wish it had worked out so that I would have been able to visit with you all in person last spring. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has, uh, has, has made uh, you know, a a mess in a way of all of our plans, but I, I'm so delighted that thanks to Zoom and to ingenuity and to colleagueship that we can have this discussion um, virtually, uh, even if we can't have it in person. And I hope someday that I will be able to be with you in person. Uh, 
It's a terrific honor. It's a tremendous honor to be invited to give the Moreau Lecture. Um, as Father Issing said, I spent many years at Notre Dame and came to admire and even cherish his vision of, of what the, the role of Catholics is, are rather, in, in the world, and, and particularly the idea of communicating the vision of each and every one of us as God's precious child. How different life would be if we looked at the people we interact with in person, um, over the internet, on Twitter, as precious to God. Uh, that, that would be a revolutionary uh, way of thinking about our obligations to one another. I'm very grateful uh, to Father Ising, Professor Prusak, and Christo Huntington uh, for organizing this and responding to my lecture, and to Dr. Rose for for uh, keeping a chaos out of the questions. And I, please, I'm very happy to answer questions. I find that the most enjoyable part of any talk I give because I get to learn from the questions. I already know what I think, but I don't know what you think. And, 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 and that conversation, I think, is what's most helpful to all of us. So my talk today is about voting, really. Uh, something that we uh, we have to do, or most of us have to do, in a couple of weeks now. These are difficult times in the United States and in the world. We face great responsibilities. And what I hope to be able to do is help us think a little bit about the ethics of voting. What does it mean to think about voting as an act that is a moral act? That is an act not that's always moral, but that is susceptible to ethical analysis, that is susceptible to um, investigation in terms of what its meaning is and what its role is in furthering a vision of, of human beings as precious to God. Now, that's not actually a common way of thinking about voting, is it? At least in our country. So many politicians, when they ask for your vote, are really asking you to say, vote for me because I am going to advance your private interests. I'm going to keep more money in your, in your pocket. I'm going to get you more benefits that you need. I am going to be um, someone who promotes you, never mind the other people, but you. And so many people, even unfortunately, sometimes people in the church, leaders in the church, treat Catholic voters almost as if they are sheep, almost to be herded by sheepdogs to get the right result. We have to, I don't know if you've ever seen those videos. Uh, I sometimes watch them when I can't sleep at night. There's an aerial view of a sheepdog moving sheep from, from one pen into the next pen by kind of nipping at their heels and, and, uh, and kind of nudging them to do what they, the dog wants them to do. Now, this is an understandable way, I suppose, for leaders or, um, to, to treat people within the community. It's understandable, but I don't think it's right because it instrumentalizes people as citizens. It treats them as one of a number of means to get a particular result that the leader wants. And I don't think that that way of thinking about voters and Catholic voters in particular is true to the deepest insights of our tradition. Uh, before I can get into the specifics of, of why I think that's this is that this is the case, I'd like to say a little bit about the framework in which all of this discussion has to be situated in order to make any sense for Catholics. As Catholics, we don't believe that our religion is private. It's not just about me and God, nor is it simply a matter of feeling. Catholic teaching, Catholic faith has implications for how all human beings should live their lives together. And those implications are worked out in the documents and reflections that are commonly called Catholic social teaching. Um, and there are, you can find Catholic social teaching in the, in the catechism. You can also find it in the compendium of Catholic social teaching. But, um, and it's hard to boil down uh, to, you know, to its essence, 
But I'm going to try to do this uh, by just briefly indicating seven principles of Catholic social teaching that guide how we think about, guide our moral imaginary for voting, but also for very much uh, everything else that we do in the context of our public life. And these come from the uh, uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, it's, 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 it's a list, it may not be a fully complete list, but it gets at some important points. Uh, the life and dignity of the human person is the most important piece. All people are sacred because everyone's made in the image and likeness of God. People do not lose their dignity because of disability, poverty, age, lack of success, or race. Second, Catholic social teaching talks about a call to family, community, and participation. The human person isn't just an isolated monad. Human people are designed to be in community. Third, we have to talk not only about our rights, but about our responsibilities. People have a fundamental right to life, food, shelter, healthcare, education, employment. And all people have a right and a duty to participate in, in decisions that affect their lives. Corresponding to these rights and the duty to participate are the duties to respect the rights of others in the wider society and to work together for the common good. Point four is the option for the poor and vulnerable. The moral test of a society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. The poor have an urgent claim on the conscience of the nation. Point five is the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Catholics believe that work isn't simply a means of earning a living. It is that, but it's also a way of contributing to the society. It's a way of realizing our vocation. So people have a right to decent and productive work, fair wages, private property, and economic initiative. The economy, to put it another way, exists to serve people, not the other way around. Solidarity is a key concept for Catholic social thought. It says that we are one human family and our responsibilities to each other cross national, racial, economic, and ideological differences. That doesn't mean that our responsibilities to our family and to the, our neighborhood and to our nation aren't different in some ways, but it means we can't cut off our responsibilities at those borders. And finally, we have a responsibility to care for God's creation. The goods of the earth are good gifts from God. We have a responsibility to care for them as stewards and trustees, not mere users or consumers. So these Big principles of Catholic social teaching are oriented toward the public, not simply to me as a private citizen who's trying to get what I can from my politician. They're oriented toward the common good, and they're oriented toward the flourishing of the person within the community. All that's great, but how do you translate that into voting? How do we think about voting, voting within the broader context of Catholic social teaching? Well, the bishops have tried to help us do that, and they've issued um, two voting guides over the years, um, which have somewhat different philosophies. The first voting guide is Political Responsibility, Reflections on an Election Year in 1976. And that kind of, in terms of iterations, govern the voting guides up until 2007, when forming consciences for faithful citizenships took over and has been revised um, from that point um, on in some form or other, but still based on the basic document of forming consciences for faithful citizenship. Kathy? What? Yep. This, is, this is Bernard Prusak. Do you mean to be sharing your screen? 
no, now I'm going to be start sharing my screen. That was the background to sharing my screen. So now the screen comes up. Great. So that was the introduction to the PowerPoint. Um, and here it comes. And, and so this is, that was just a little bit of background for voting because we can't talk about um, voting without understanding as Catholics what it is. So as I just said, we've got two kinds of voting guides, two types of voting guides under two titles. Political Responsibility, Reflections on the Election Year, 1976 to two, and now the latest iteration of Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship in 2020. And you can see a little bit of middle age spread, if you like, um, in the evolution of the documents. Political responsibility was about 3,000 words, identified eight issues in alphabetical order, abortion, economy, food policy, housing, human rights, mass media, and military expenditures. There was no ranking of issues. As I said, they were in alphabetical order. And there was a single author, John Carr. Uh, forming consciences for faithful citizenship is remarkably different. It's over 18,000 words long. It identifies over 50 issues and sub-issues, and there's a confusing ranking of issues. Abortion is preeminent on the one hand, it says, but at the other hand, on the other hand, it says you can't be a single issue voter. It's clearly a committee document with pieces in it to reflect the interests and concerns of different constituencies within the church and within the bishop's conference itself. So if you read Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship, you might be a little confused because there are so many issues and it's not entirely clear what to do with them. I think some of the problem is that it is a committee document, but I think there's also a more fundamental problem, which is that it's almost exclusively focused on issues. What are the issues with issues? I think the framing of issues seems simple, but it's actually quite confusing. One problem is we don't know what an issue is. We need a little bit of help in figuring out how to think about an issue because the term is used in many different ways. Sometimes it's a complex problem with many causes, such as hunger or global warming or even illegal immigration. Sometimes it's an entire section of the social life, such as the economy. Sometimes we say an issue is a morally objectionable practice. My issue is abortion, that's what I'm voting on. Sometimes you could say that it's a particular legislative proposal authorizing same-sex marriage or banning capital punishment. Sometimes we use the term issue to refer to a complex policy like Middle East strategy. And sometimes we use the term to refer to a fundamental value running through law and society like free exercise of religion. So how do you deal with all of these things which come under the category of issues. It's almost like apples and oranges, and not only apples and oranges, but pears and bananas too. There's another issue with issues. Even if you understand what an issue is, they're not always commensurable. Sometimes you have an important issue. Other times you face an urgent issue. So an important issue is illustrated by the house on the left, right? Your house has a sinking foundation. If you don't shore that up, the whole thing will collapse. It's incredibly important to get that foundation issue sorted out. But the issue on the right, the roof is on fire, is an urgent issue. If you don't put out the fire in the roof, you're never gonna be able to get to the foundation or rather, you get to the foundation, but there'd be no point to shoring it up because there's nothing on top of it. A third issue with issues, at least when thinking about voting, is that we need to expect the unexpected. 
we've got these great voting guides or we've got these fulsome voting guides, but they don't cover everything. If you think about it, every president we've had, you know, uh, more or less in the 20th century who has had to deal with something that he couldn't have expected when he took office. President Bush and the 9-11 terrorist attacks, who knew that that would totally occupy his presidency? President Barack Obama, the Great Recession of 2007-2008, that took over. And now President Trump has been consumed, or at least the country under President Trump has been consumed with the coronavirus. So we have many issues with issues. They're important to think about, but they can't provide the whole framework that we have for understanding what we're doing in the voting booth. We need to talk about something other than issues. I think we need to start again. So let's start with some basics. Do we have an obligation to vote? And I'm going to take a strong stand here and say yes we do have an obligation to vote. It's a role-related obligation of being a citizen in a representative democracy. It's part of your job. Part of your job is to go into that voting booth or look at that mail-in ballot and say, who do I, as someone who is both a, 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 a ruler, because you are in a sense in a representative democracy, and a subject, think is best suited to lead the country. Now, some people argue, oh, I couldn't possibly vote. I can't taint myself with voting. I will be cooperating with evil if I vote because I will be contributing to the election of somebody who's going to do some bad things. I'd like to take a strong stand here and say, the use of the categories of cooperation with evil in the context of voting is actually a mistaken use of the category. This is not what everybody thinks. It's not even what all the bishops have said, but let me explain why. We have role-related obligations that block cooperation with evil analysis in many cases. So if I'm a nurse in an emergency room and a gangster comes in, bleeding from a gunshot room, I don't say, you know, I might treat you, but if I do the cooperation with evil analysis and you get better, you're probably going to go out and kill more people, so I think it's better not to. Some roles that we enter into, we foresee they may cause some harm down the road, but we don't do the cooperation with evil analysis because our role blocks it. And I think the obligation to vote is one of those roles. What do you do when you vote? Well, you participate in the democratic process. That's the most important thing. Even if you are in Massachusetts, say like I am, and it's almost a foregone conclusion that the Democrats are gonna win, you still need to participate. Other things you do include selection. You help select the next person who's going to fulfill the office that you're voting at. And thirdly, sometimes we express our political will in a very crude way by voting. Sometimes what you do when you're voting is to say, I can't vote for any of these people. I'm gonna vote in a write-in way. I'm gonna name someone. I'm going to pick somebody that I don't think can win because I wanna send a message that the the most viable candidates are also unacceptable. And by the way, that's another way of addressing some of the cooperation with evil cases, right in a candidate. We can also start again by recognizing the fact that in most cases, in most elections, unless you're dealing with a referendum, you're voting for candidates, not issues. You're picking somebody to be a leader, to handle the issues you know, the issues you don't know, the urgent issues, the important issues, and the, the issues that are surprises. So I'd like to suggest that what we do when we vote is 
is, is since we vote for candidates, is evaluate candidates on four big criteria. Competence. You have to ask yourself, does the candidate have the intellectual capacity, the experience, the temperament, and the judgment to do the job? Character is number two. It's not number two in terms of importance. I think they're equally important. Does the candidate have a good set of moral values consonant with some of the commitments of Catholic social teaching, even if they're not Catholic? And the integrity to pursue them and in situations of temptation and fear. Collaboration. Can the candidate work well with other people, both political allies and opponents? And connections. Let's be realistic. No candidate is out there as the shining savior for anyone. What are the moral ramifications and the practical ramifications of their connections, both political and financial, for the manner in which they will carry out their jobs? Politicians don't act alone. They take their place within networks of political power. Now, all of these criteria have to be judged separately, and they're not fungible. So Mother Teresa, for example, were she still alive, would have a tremendous character, but she probably didn't have the, the competence and the experience to be the president of the United States, even if she were an American citizen. Let's zoom in a bit on character. What are the qualities of a virtuous politician? Well, I think you can't do any better than going back to Aristotle and Aquinas and looking at the cardinal virtues. Is the politician prudent? Do they seek a wide range of advice, even from people that aren't yes people, evaluating that advice and making sound decisions? Are they committed to justice, not just concerned with me and mine, people who voted for me, but with the well being of everyone? Are they temperate? Do they have temperance? Do they desire money, fame, and power more than actually to contribute to the common good? That, that would mean that they didn't have the virtue of temperance, and that's a big problem. And do they have the virtue of fortitude? Are they either overly fearful or overly rash? Do they overly desire avoiding confrontation? Are they eager to rush right into confrontations? You need what's called a mean, a balance. I think we should be talking about these virtues and asking ourselves what's ideal to hold ourselves accountable to, but also what's good enough since you can't just simply grow your own politician like a chia pet. Wouldn't it be nice if we could some days? That brings us back to candidates and issues. I'm not saying we shouldn't ask what a candidate's stand is on an issue. I think we should, but even that's complicated. It involves a judgment that a particular situation poses a problem for the common good and a view about what has caused that situation and a proposal to remedy that. People may disagree about each element of a stance on an issue, and it's important to pinpoint where you agree or don't agree with a candidate. For example, you may agree with a judgment that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, that climate change is a problem, but you may disagree about what caused the situation. Somebody might agree or not agree that human beings have caused it, and you may different have different views about what the remedy should be. At the same time, we also need to ask ourselves, why are a candidate's stance on issues important? Sometimes it's because the candidate can do something about them. But if you're voting for, say, somebody for a school board, probably their stance on Middle East peace isn't really crucial on that stance. But sometimes we value or we evaluate a candidate's stance on issues because we say it reveals something about the character of the candidate. If somebody doesn't seem to give a hoot about poverty or about climate change, you might say, well, that's somebody who's indicating that they don't really care about a key element of the common good, and that's something I need to take into account. 
It's one thing to have somebody not care about a key issue. It's another thing to have a candidate have a different view about how to remedy it. That doesn't mean you're gonna vote for somebody with a different view, but I think it's a different sort of consideration. So that's my brief investigation of thinking about how we might reboot our analysis of voting, focusing on the moral obligation to vote and the fact that we're voting for candidates, not simply picking issues or picking uh, candidates as a simple vehicle to a simple resolution of an issue. It's much more complicated than that. The only thing I would like to leave you with is really an exhortation to vote. Please remember to vote because I do think it is part of your obligation as a citizen, as a, as a subject, as a partial sovereign, and as a Catholic committed to the common good. Thank you very much.